I can tune band filling by substituting in the vote mono or diagonal of materials. I can change band width by moving up and down the Kalschneider and Ignite series. By filling the 4Fs, I can have local moments with varying anisotropy or fragile magnets or heavy perineums. But even with that insight, the problem is the number of potential compounds is huge. And even if I get rid of the noble gases, and hot materials, I still have about 80 elements to play with, okay? And if I do some grotesque combinatorials and estimates of how many elements in the human binary trinary, I come up with millions of compounds. And if I go to quaternaries or alloys and doping series, I've got tens of millions. That's too large a number, okay? I can't do it with just blind combinatorials. So how do we choose what sample to make? Okay? So in this talk, I want to give you an idea of how to coax the unicorn out of the forest. Okay. Or how to have dreams of sugar pumps dance in your head. Or, if not sugar pumps, then maybe other delightful things. All right. We all have our dreams and ambitions. Okay. So, I really want to give you an idea of how to create the ideas for new materials and how to make them manifest themselves. Okay. So, in my own group, we have three ways of trying to narrow phase space, and that's what I want to talk about in this discussion, okay? So, sometimes we want a specific compound, sometimes we want a specific ground state, and sometimes we want to search for known and unknown unknowns, okay? Now, these motivations blend into each other, and as I go through the talk, I'll try to give you a sense of how they feed into each other, okay? So, let's start with one and a specific compound, okay? This is sort of the obvious one in the sense that it greatly reduces phase space. All possibilities become, a lot of specific compound projected on the periodic table is a delta function. Okay? That's the extent of complicated mathematics I'm going over in the talk. I'm sorry to have had a whole slide on mathematics. Okay, right. Here's good with you. All right, good. Okay, now hopefully the specific compound is the word of the new field. So, you know, you want to choose from here. So, let me give some examples, okay? Sort of as a warlock, I want to point out that as we try to grow each of these materials over the decades, we had to extend our growth techniques so that we could get the material so we could do the physics we're interested in. Remember, getting the sample is just the enabling step, so then we as physicists could do our measurements and hopefully gain some insight. All right? So, on with the show. In 1994, there were two superconducting compounds discovered. At Tata Institute, at Bell Labs, these were yttrium palladium boral carbide and TC nickel boral carbide. They had TCs rivaling the highest boron mediated TCs at the time. Okay? We really wanted to try to grow the TC nickel boral carbide because it was stable as opposed to metal stable. Okay? Now, this is a tricky growth. It's a quaternary compound, it's a refractory compound, it's incongruently melting. Okay? But we had a strong drive to try to make it. And after studying the phase diagram and a couple dozen growths that didn't work, I appreciated if you look at the nickel boron binary phase diagram, so here's composition, here's temperature, you have this cascade of eutectics below 1,500 that offers you a liquid you want to grow this material out of. So we devised the two step process where we would cool from 1,500 to 1,200. We would punch to room temperature, reseal, and then heat to 1,200 and decant and get large, beautiful single crystals of the TC nickel boron carbide. Okay. Now, this material has a TC of about 17. It has actually a rather remarkably low HC2. It has a minor anisotropy. That's sort of nice. On the other hand, what we were able to do is have a group of TC nickel boron carbide. We can look at the other rare nickel boron carbides, and with thulium, erbium, holmium, and dysprosium, we have not only superconductivity, but we have anti-paramagnetic order, and the interaction and competition between them. Okay. So, we have a progression. We wanted a specific compound, we can see nickel boron carbon. Once we had it, we can generalize and look at the interaction of superconductivity and magnetism in all of these materials, and as often is the case, this can lead to then surprises or unknowns. In this case, the unknown was the discovery of the fact that in these materials, if you apply a small magnetic field, you can see, which at the time was one of the first examples of a hexagonal the square vortex lattice, okay? due to basic non-local corrections for the uh, uh, square symmetry of the basal. Okay, now, 
as you'll see, this is not a talk about any one system. I'm trying to give you a sense of where ideas come from. And we're right now in the sort of warm-up part. So another compound we really wanted, 1997, we wanted to grow rare magnesiums and quasi-crystals to say the magnetic properties, because up until that point, these recently discovered materials had only been polygrain and polyphase. Okay? So that left us with the desire to try to grow a yttria magnesium zinc quasi crystal, and we figured out we could grow it out of excess magnesium and zinc. The problem was excess magnesium and zinc is excess highly reactive, highly volatile elements, so we had to develop a way of containing these, which forced us to create what we call a channel three cap crucible, something that's a channel two, you roll the caps above and below to have a sealed ampule, but before you do that, you put in a third cap of holes through it to act as a brick to separate. Okay? With this in hand, we were able to grow beautiful single grains of rare magnesium zinc that as a bonus manifest the natural growth habits, which is a pentagonal connected Okay, Now, after we have the mag, <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. It's the real thing. Now, here's you do not win the prize for the uh, uh, stupidest question because I've had people when I first showed this saying, How long did it take you to kind of polish that to look that way? <laughs> so I'd have to say, Well, Nature's kind. Yeah, no, this is actually a pentagonal uh, that even that's real quasi crystal. But I'd love to mention approximates because they'll show up later. If it was approximate, like a cubic approximate, it would have had a cubic morphology. Yeah, so no, that's neat, but we'll come back to approximates. All right, so we have the materials in here. We can go it not only for atrium, but we can also go it for gadolinium, which is Heisenberg, if you know, it's the splitting, and non Heisenberg, terbium, fluorbium. We were able to find out these are magnificent examples of spin classes. You have an aperiodic rare sublattice, okay? Now, having said they're beautiful examples, we can say, well, what do you do with them? Well, we were able to look at or try to address the question of is there a difference between a Heisenberg and non Heisenberg spin class? We can look at the paramagnetic theta versus the Jens factor for all of these, okay, for the pure rare magazines, as well as the yttrium terbium and yttrium gadolinium infusion, and the all the Jens scale almost in a textbook fashion. Okay. On the other hand, if we take the freezing temperature versus the data, two experimentally measured parameters, high temperature and low temperature, this breaks into two manifolds. We have a Heisenberg manifold, all the gadolinium, and a non-Heisenberg. Okay. And what we can see is for the same data, a non-Heisenberg spin glass freezes at about twice the temperature. And if we back that out into understanding, if the floor was covered with marbles that are burning spheres, it would be slippery. If we split those marbles up, it would be less slippery with freeze or redness. Okay. Now, one of the bonuses here for me is spin classes were always thought to be associated with randomness. Okay? Here I have a highly ordered, albeit aperiodic subclass. So, in this case, we went from one entry of dancing to one to study the spin glass state, who appreciated it, you could have differences between Heisenberg and non Heisenberg spin classes. In 2001, there were rumors that Enchimitsu could superconduct at 40 Kelvin. Boy, did we want a specific material. Akinitsu mentioned at a conference on spin ladders insulators that there might be superconductivity at 40 Kelvin, and that's it. And it was like sort of setting off a firecracker in Atlanta. We all wanted to try to understand this material. You can look at the binary phase diagram, it is inauspicious. There is no exposed liquidness. It's not easy to grow single crystals. We actually tried hundreds of growths of binaries, ternaries, quaternaries. I used a kilogram of platinum. It didn't work. Okay? I did find that to be okay. On the other hand, it can actually grow very nice high purity polycrystalline samples. And as a physicist, I'm willing to measure what I can get. Okay? We found out that if you take high purity boron, you can expose it to one third atmosphere of magnesium partial pressure at 950, and as little as three hours, you get high purity MGD2. With high purity MGD2 and isotopic boron, you can look at the isotope effect. You see a one column shift in magnetization and resistivity in specific heat. The first paper published on superconductivity in MGD2 showed that this is consistent with boron mediated BCS superconductivity. Okay. With samples in hand, you can see that the HC2 is relatively modest, 15 Tesla. It's a fantastically good metal, and we were able to come up with a technique of inferring anisotropic HC2 from polycrystalline samples 
and we can see there's a moderate anisotropy. But that's looking at a specific compound. As we move to wanting to understand a specific ground state, we can try to modify this and see if we can improve it. Here is the upper critical field for niobium 310 or warp or superconductor. Okay. Pure MGB2 has a higher TC but a much lower HC2. Okay. On the other hand, if we can shorten the electronic beam free path, for example, by moving in carbon, we can add 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 percent carbon, and we can go from 15 to 20 to 25 to 30 to 35 Tesla. All carbon doped MGB2 supersedes the HC2 phase diagram for niobium 310 over the whole temperature range. And perhaps more importantly, we have what's now 15 years later called the MGB2 zone of use, 20 Kelvin. Niobium 310 is not superconducting, and MGB2 can have a sizable HC2. 20 Kelvin is cheap to reach by a simple closed cycle refrigerator, it is flex. In the intervening 15 years, humanity has figured out how to make multi-filamentary wires, wrap them in coils, and you actually have prototypical open access Helmholtz MRIs made from MGB2. This is what condensed matter physics can do for you. It goes from, my God, what is that, to, hey, and we can use it, and sometimes it is as little as a decade. Now, last example of one specific compound, and then we'll go to the more interesting motivations. So, in 2008, we wanted to grow pure and passive substituted barium iron to arsenic to. Why? Because Joran's group had discovered that this was a much easier example of an iron based superconductor. Within 14 hours of reading of this discovery, we had the world's first single crystals. They looked like this. This allowed us to measure anisotropic HC2. What we can see is with a TC slightly less than 30, even 14 Tesla only suppresses it to about 26 Kelvin. So HC2 is going to be huge. In addition, this looks like a relatively small anisotropy, but we need higher fields. So we went to the National Magnetic, High Magnetic Field Laboratory, and we can see that indeed the anisotropy is coming relatively smaller, but perhaps more importantly, we can see that 20 Kelvin, which remember for MGD2 was nice because we could reach that easily, and 20 Kelvin, the lower HC2 is in excess of 40 Tesla, in excess of anything, MGB2 or niobium 3 has to offer. Within a few months of discovery of these materials, it was clear they had potential as applied superconductors, in addition to being very interesting basic physics materials. But with these materials, let me try to explore a little more specifically how we go from one specific compound to these other two motivations. And then we'll start looking at these motivations in isolation. Okay, so let's start with wanting a specific compound. Uh, this is the ground state. With MG, with barium iron to arsenic to, we can start with iron and we can substitute in various transition metals. Athena Sapisapat at Oak Ridge discovered that you could substitute cobalt in for iron and induce superconductivity. This led to a desire to generalize and to understand this more clearly. Okay, so what you can do is you can look at the various 3Ds, you can move down to 4Ds and 5Ds as you will. And instead of having, you know, your blind common total millions of compounds, we're talking less than a dozen substitution series. And with this, we look at a subset of just looking at cobalt rhodium, nickel palladium. With cobalt and rhodium, we have exactly the same phase diagram. We suppress the overwhelming antiferromagnetic transitions, split it a little, see a dome of superconductivity existing both under the antiferromagnetic overwhelming and outside of it, with a maximum near what might be a quantum critical point. For nickel and palladium, we see the same phase diagram, but basically scaled by a factor of two, indicating that electron count is essentially the key parameter here. These studies help define our understanding of what are the rules for superconductivity in these materials. What's the relation between structural magnetic and electronic degrees of freedom? Okay. Now, unknowns. Okay. Well, we can have barium, we can have spontium. What about calcium? What about magnesium? Do they exist? Okay. The reason I say this is barium iron to arsenic do, strontium iron to arsenic do, were known compounds before iron based superconductivity. On the other hand, there was no report of calcium or magnesium. And they make. Okay. It turns out calcium does make. We were able to discover the structure, grow it in single crystal form, and it's an extreme example of an alkaline earth iron to arsenic. Material. You have a strongly coupled first order magnetic and structural phase transition. Okay? 
in addition, this material is one of the most pressure sensitive, having one of the smallest sea lattice parameters. And with very little pressure, about 0.4, 0.35 GPA, you can go from a tetragonal to a collapsed tetragonal phase, which completely changes the magnetism and superconductivity. Now, on the other hand, what about magnesium? Well, magnesium just doesn't make. We tried polluting, we tried pure. I know the Thomas group did. I know that Ian's group did. I know that other groups have tried it. Sometimes you reach the end of the pure. Okay? So this is an exploration for a unknown, but just as nature saying, no, or at least not yet. But let me now start talking about the other motivations, because this is where life gets interesting. I want to look at explicitly how you can use wanting a specific ground state to reduce phase space and provide pure guidance for what you want to grow. Okay? So now you're starting with an idea of a specific physical state and negotiating with nature as to where you might be able to find it. Okay? Let me start with a crazy video in heavy fermion, and then I'll move on to a more recent example. Okay? But a number of years ago, and if Joe's here don't remember a lot of this story, okay, we wanted to try to look for crazy lithium based materials that would manifest a clear and equilibrium ground state. Now, given that Canisio is a non cramer ion, that requires us to take some care. Okay? We want to make sure we have some entropy at low temperatures that we might hypothetically be transferring over into an electronic channel. Okay? Now, that requires you know, attention. Serium or tertium. Our framers that guaranteed R log two. Here we've got a single ground state and have R log one, which is zero. So if we have a cubic point symmetry, we can go to Lee Least and Wolf, and we can see that there's a gamma three non-magnetic doublet. That looks promising. Okay, so let's see if we can find some crazy systems that are in a gamma three state. Okay? How do we go about doing that? Well, first we want to look at what nature now, as, as known, we go to the handbooks, and in those days, these actually were books. Okay, so you could sit and look at Pearson's and try to figure out what structures might work. And you do that by basically having a list. I don't want a cubic unit cell. I want a similar rare site. I want that rare site in a cubic point symmetry. And by the way, I like that rare if you praise it in you. These seem to be stupidly trivial statements, but each of these is narrowing phase space and what you try to find what you're interested in. Okay? So, here's one of these pages off of old Pearson's. Here's the CF16, this is by Floyd, also known as the Oyster structure. Here's silver 2 in the Imprisidinia. That fit all these criteria. So did Crazy Red 3, so did a few other materials. You can then see what literature has to say about it. Okay? It turns out that Paisio Silver to Indium had been looked at by Rosemary Galera and co workers in Grenoble in the 70s and 80s in the desire and attempt to find singlet Paisidinium compounds. This was a failure. They wrote it up in the proceedings and moved on. Thank God for proceedings and people taking time writing it up because their failure was exactly what we were looking for. We were able to reproduce their, uh, uh, scattered, their inelastic scattering results. You have a gamma 3. Doublet separated by 6 MeV, 60 Kelvin, from the first excited state. We can take these states and compare it to our specific heat, take the distribution of shock anomalies, it fits the data beautifully. At low temperatures, we can look at the specific heat, and below half a Kelvin, it rolls over and goes linearly through 0, 0, which is in plot C over T versus T, rises and saturates above 6 joules per mole squared. If that's electronic, this is a very heavy, heavy fermion. So, this negotiation with nature sort of lets us answer the following questions. Can entropy be preserved in a crazy of these systems low enough temperatures to hybridize? Apparently, yes, if you do it carefully enough. You can do it yourself, you can point to the tree gamma 3. Can a crazy based compound go heavy? It appears yes, but it's fundamentally different physics because a heavy fermion in cerium or a terpene is a dynamic screening. But a dynamic screening of a fluctuating moment. There's no moment here. I think this is probably a dynamic screening of a predisposition to have a yon teller distortion. Okay, that's the mechanism for your transfer. This is an example of how you can use a desire to have a certain state to negotiate with nature in a narrow phase space. Okay. Let me go to a more recent example, something I call fragile magnets. Okay. 
This is an example where I'm going to try to show you how we can incorporate computational work also in an attempt to narrow the phase space. So, let's have an insightful idea. One that no one else has had. Okay? I would like to find more IT superconductors. That's my idea. Now, that's not a helpful idea because it doesn't help you narrow phase space very much. I can go to Chris and say, Chris, I have a great idea. I want to find more ITCs. And he goes, lovely. Do you want to point me in some direction? Okay. So we can look at the ITCs we have. Okay. We can look at the cuprates. We can look at the iron base. We can look at heavy fermions, which we can argue are ITCs in their own right. If we look at these, the one thing that we see proximal to the superconductivity in every case, either next to it or intersecting it, is a crashing antiferromagnetic transition. Okay. So we have antiferromagnetism proximal to the superconductivity, and the fact that it's crashing, as far as I'm concerned, makes it a fragile magnetic state. You often see in the ECR size that the size of the ordered moment is diminishing as you go down as well. So let's rephrase our desire. I'd like to find transition metal based fragile magnets. Now, I'm starting to have something a little more actionable. Okay. So, we can start by limiting phase space by focusing on you know, your sort of Casablanca round of the usual suspects. We can take chromium, iron, cobalt, nickel. If your usual suspect is not there, don't worry, we can put it in. But we don't really need to for the sake of this argument, because honestly, these four are quite enough. As a matter of fact, to give you an idea of the scope that we're still left with, we can just look at cobalt, okay? So, in the intervening decades, Pearson's has gone from these lovely books that you can set in your lap, and when you get five, your lap is sore, and you can start talking on the floor, to being an online, or at least on your laptop, surgical system, okay? So, I can take cuts, okay? Let me take a specific cut. Let me take a cobalt-bearing compound, let me have it ternary, let me have it tetragonal to itself. This is a subset of a subset of a subset of the possible materials, okay? But this, you know, greatly reduced space gives me over 1,000 bits. If I get rid of duplications and alloys and whistle formation, I still have hundreds of possible compounds, okay? Now, what can we do? Well, we can try to work with our computational colleagues. I have gone to so many conferences where I've been told we can do materials by size and I have two experimentalists. We can do it all in silicon. Okay? Now I've been called many things, but I've not been called redundant. I have not been called redundant. That was a little too on the nose. All right, fine. So, uh, it's actually hard. So let me explain what we're trying to do. In working with our computational colleagues, you need to ask sharp questions. I don't want a high TC as a good. I want a fragile magnet as a good. Let me try and make a sharp question. Okay? So we want something that indicates a degree of fragility. We can say size of ordered bone. Okay? Now, computation really prefers to work on pure line compounds rather than alloys or substitutions. So we can say, let's look at the effects of pressure on an ordered compound. Now, that's emphasizing band width over band filling, but fortunately, if we look at the iron based materials, they actually have very similar effects. If we look at barium iron torsion to pressure, so that's what we're talking about the magnetic field and superconductivity, add cobalt, you get the same phase diagram. If something's fragile, it tends to be fragile in multiple dimensions, so this isn't too surprising. Okay? So, maybe we can use this as a way of trying to identify these materials. So, experimentally, it's sort of business as usual. We try to identify promising candidate materials, data mining, literature search, intuition, exploration. We can measure magnetization, electrical transport, specific heat, up to one, two, or eight GPA, determine the degree of fragility. We can use chemical substitution. That's not any problem for us. And systems that have apparently fragile transitions, we are studying. We'll look at a few of them at this point. Computationally, we're trying to provide benchmark data to our computational colleagues, both that are fragile and not fragile, and see if we can understand them. Once methodologies are considered reliable, we want to use them to make first cuts of candidate materials, and then the results from these candidate materials are fed back in. We have started trying to do this, but it's hard, and actually one of the hardest things we run into is the fact that a lot of these cobalt materials, or chromium, or 
nickel or whatever, there is data about that. And the first question is, are they anti-paramagnetic? And if I'm anti-paramagnetic, this is going to be high Q calculations. And high Q is still something that's a little different. So we're working on that with our colleagues right now. But this is an attempt to use computation in narrow case space. And it's been neat because it gives you an appreciation for what computation can do. But it's also interesting in showing, at least me, how far away we are from materials by design, except for materials that have to be one large salient energy scale. Semiconductors, okay, we can probably do that by design. Okay? But for superconductors and fragile magnets, it's a little harder. But we're working on it. Now, what I've been waiting Let's talk about the third motivation. Search for known and unknown unknowns. Okay? The known unknowns is something we've seen already. We've seen run across the series, we've seen the study of family, but let me call it out explicitly. Okay? A run across the series is what our group calls exploring a rare earth family. Okay? Because generally, if you can grow one rare earth member of a rare earth XY series, other members exist. So, if there's just data saying gadolinium XY exists, you probably can get terbium and samarium and maybe the adidium and maybe erbium XY also exists, even if there's no data about them. This is a known unknown. Okay? I know it's out there, I don't know anything about it. Over the decades, we have done these studies on quite a number of series, basically because it allows us to create an understanding of what the non-magnetic, the local mold, the hybridizing mold that members of the series are to discover unexpected things, but then also to have an inventory of behavior that lets us ask sharp physical questions later on. When I was a postdoc at Los Alamos, I did a run across the rare Elizabeth Platinum series. We discovered a jury in Elizabeth Platinum. 20 years later, these were identified as possible topological materials based on that run across the series. Now, we can also explore similar crystal structures. We saw that to a certain extent when we went from barium iron to arsenic to the spawns and the calcium and the find magnesium. In these cases, it's pretty clear that there is, you know, some stuff we know, we can extrapolate and anticipate there's some stuff we don't know. But that's not where the fun is. The fun is looking for unknown unknowns. These are directed but somewhat more unfocused searches. Let me give you a flavor of these. Okay, these I consider vital, but I also consider them difficult because they're much harder to justify to funding agencies. So, let me give you two examples of what's happened. One's called the Deep Paratechnic Project, the other's called Refund Solutions. Okay? Deep Paratechnic. So, binary phase diagram. Temperature, composition, there's platinum in your skin. You have two types of compounds. You have congruity melting compounds that are generally relatively easy to form. You can take a uh, solution of that composition, slowly cool it, and get crystal of that composition. And then you have incongruently melting compounds, or compounds that decompose paratactically. When this decomposition temperature is well below the liquidness of the same composition, that usually indicates that it would be difficult to grow single crystals of these by conventional either arc melting or bridgement or other techniques. And it often signals that there probably isn't a lot of good research on single crystal data unless they've been grown by solution growth. Where until recently, not a lot of people were doing that. So often these are materials that are known to exist, but there's nothing known about them. So let's go on. And we have been the liberty of deciding that's more time to move on, or all oh, I know is it's interesting, let's look a little more. So, platinum tin four is a nice example of that. This is a material that is uh, uh, somewhat deep in its paratechnic temperature. Okay? If you can beautifully grow crystals of it by taking 4% platinum, 96% tin, cooling down from 600 to 350, you get beautiful single crystals in 60 hours. So, over a weekend, you get nice samples. Lovely. If you look at these, these are beautiful samples for metal physics. And you love to grow at 140. You have residual resistivity ratios in excess of 1,000. Okay? Now, having said that, if you measure the resistivity in a field, you can see that for 14 Tesla, this screams up. You have huge magneto resistances. In the units of magneto resistance, we have a 500,000% magneto resistance. This is sort of the original extreme or titanic magneto resistance. Okay? We found quantum oscillations in anything we care to measure. Okay? So this was interesting, and in 2012 we published it as, look at 
this really high purity curious material. Now, in the ensuing years, with studies of non-trivial topologies and frac physics, etc., I came to speculate that if materials have really massive magnetic resistances, it might be an experimental indication that there is some novel topology associated with them. And indeed, I was able to convince my colleague, uh, Adam Kaminsky, who has an uh, in-house laser archives to look at these, and in Platinum Tin 4, we found evidence of something called drag node arcs. So, this is something that you would have never imagined and you come across it simply because we're pursuing unknown unknowns. Okay? Another example from the Deep Paradigm Project. We figured out how to handle zinc as a solvent when we were looking at rare transition metal to zinc 20 materials. I will talk about those materials in this discussion. On the other hand, having mastered zinc, I had two undergraduates one summer, and I figured, let's look at scandium zinc-12. It might be an interesting material with the loop scandium. Okay? This is a tetragonal material whose structure is known. Okay? We grew this. Without any measurements, the one thing I can say is, that's not tetragonal. Okay? So, what happened is, we had to redefine the phase diagram. And, you know, this is something we're doing more and more of these days, and I sort of take offense at it. It's not my job to make these types of phase diagrams. But on the other hand, we had to add another compound. Here's a quasi-crystal phase. This is the second known stable binary quasi-crystal. Uh, icosahedral scandium zinc, okay? And, back to Pierce's question, we appreciated it. it's right next to scandium zinc 6, which is a crystalline approximate. Cubic or to What we speculated is, my God, there might be a lot of deeply paratechnically composing quasi crystals next to approximates. I wonder if we could find others. Okay? And we left it there until my colleague and dear friend Alan Bowman said, Hey, what about Gatto Cat 6? That's a crystal of approximate. So we went into this system explicitly wanting to see if we could find an undiscovered quasi crystalline phase, and indeed we did. We found a gadolinium cadmium icosahedral phase shown here. And more importantly, we could go up for yttrium as well as other rare earths out to erbium or erbium. So it was a new family of binary quasi crystals that had local moment magnetism, and we could look at spin glass or not spin glass physics. All right. We find solutions. Another way of exploring for unknown unknowns. If you want to create materials from solution growth, you need to have a solution. Working with volatile elements or uh, reactive elements can be difficult. Okay? Why would you want to do that? Well, when I started at Los Alamos with Zach and Joe, I was growing things out of business. I pushed our decanting temperatures to work with antimony. Okay? Over the last few years, we've been working more with arsenic and phosphorus. As we move up this series, we're narrowing our bandwidth, it would be lovely to grow crystals with nitrogen. But getting nitrogen in solution is not easy. Okay? If I look at binary phase diagrams, though, lithium nitrogen shows that as we go from lithium to lithium to nitrogen, there's allegedly a liquid. It's not clear if there's a lot of vapor pressure over this, though, so we need to go in carefully because you might have explosions with molten lithium, which sort of are fun, although you might be less infested during the day. But that, <laughs> oh, someone likes lithium salts. Okay, good. All right. Now, what we can do is we can add polycrystalline lithium three nitrogen to lithium, and we can do a huge crystal, which tells you this is actually working nicely. And use camel crystals to do this. Okay. With that done, we can get out there are two lithium sites, one in a highly one-dimensional configuration between two nitrogens. If we substitute in a transition metal, we've got single ion single ion magnetic anisotropy greater than the rare earths. This is a, you know, if you're talking about magnetism, this is a holy grail. Now, it's in the lithium system. It's not going to be all that practical, but it's a fascinating physical uh, discovery. Now, we can extend that. We can go away from nitrogen and look at other systems. In one of my other jobs, we're trying to find new ferromagnets, okay? If we want to do that without rare earths, we can look at transition metal rich systems, manganese or iron, and we can put in phosphorus, okay? Phosphorus is relatively volatile. It's hard to work with in an arc melter, but these detectives, it turns out, have virtually no vapor pressure above them. So they're very promising liquids to know and discover new materials out of them. 
and we doing that. So hopefully I'll show you how unknowns then feed back into these other motivations. And in reality, you know, all of these motivations should feed into each other. So as sort of a final example, let's look at something more current and just walk around the cycle one more time. This is calcium, potassium, iron, for arsenic. Okay. This is a material that in 2016, EO and co-workers discovered as a quaternary compound associated with the alkali and alkali earth iron to arsenic two materials. These are materials that you can grow barium iron to arsenic two, potassium iron to arsenic two, calcium iron to arsenic two. They have different C lattice parameters, and what EO and co-workers found is if you maximize the contrast in C axis, essentially have an actual engaging plane, instead of having a solid solution, you can end up with a true quaternary. So in the case used in their paper, rubidium and calcium, you can have a rubidium layer, iron arsenic, calcium layer, iron arsenic, rubidium, calcium, alternating along the C lattice. This puts iron in a different point symmetry. It's a different crystal structure, and it actually happens very interesting physics. On the other hand, if you have both stresses contrast or non epitaxy of the AD plate, you get a solid solution like the barium potassium iron force that we all looked at. So, as a result of this discovery, we really wanted single crystals of this compound. So, we want a specific compound. So, William Meyer, Todd Kong had a project to try to figure out can we grow this? This is a true quaternary. The compositional phase space is this tetrahedral volume. Okay? We can actually take a pseudo ternary cut shown here, and they drop down a number of growths, and we figured out if you took a pseudo binary cut between iron arsenic and the 1144, we had a very narrow access to a primary solidification. But with that determined, we could grow beautiful single crystals of these materials. And with single crystals, we can start looking at basic properties. Okay? So, we were able to measure the anisotropic resistivity, we were able to find magnetization, expansion. We were able to find that there's a beautiful and sharp superconductive transition at 35 Kelvin, confirming what EO had found slightly lower temperature in all crystalline samples. We were also able to map out the anisotropic HC2. We can see that it's similar to what we would anticipate for the electron filling of the barium and potassium. We were able to look at detailed measurements of not only thermodynamic transport, spectroscopic, ARPES, scanning on a microscope, level penetration, cost power. And then we wanted to ask a question. This is a material that has a superconducting transition at 35 power and no magnetic or structural phase transition. Can we induce more? Okay. And the reason we ask that is if we look at the barium potassium phase diagram, which electronically is similar to what we're looking at here. The 1144 is the same as a 50 50 barium potassium mix. That's their maximum TC. And if we wanted to have some sort of structural or magnetic transition, we want to add electrons. Okay. So this led to a desire of adding cobalt and nickel and going from a quaternary to a quinary growth. Okay. Okay. We can keep going. All right. So. As we add cobalt, we suppress superconductivity. We can see that in resistance. We can see the magnetization. And beyond a small amount of cobalt, we see a new feature coming in with the resistivity. We can do the same with nickel. Again, as we add nickel, we suppress superconductivity and resistivity and magnetization. We can see the peak. We can see a new feature coming in at higher temperatures and resistivity. We can detect the basis. And we can assemble a phase diagram. Temperature, composition, the cobalt and nickel are scaled by a factor of two, again indicating that this is electron count that's dominating. We suppress superconductivity, and we see this new phase line coming in. This new phase line has no structural component. It remains in triangle, and there's not even a limit in structures we cross this transition, which is magnetic. We were able to determine it's a 2 q structure with ordering in the plane, and if we center on a given arsenic site, it's all in or all out. It's called the spin vortex crystal or H bar geometry. So, let me end. Hopefully, I've shown you we can have three motivations for growing material. Advances in one often, often inspire endeavors in another, and you really need to have an adequately 
broad research focus to allow you to cycle through this, but I think this is important if you're wanting to really be able to generate understanding and examples of novel materials. Fortunately, over the decades, DOE and specifically BS have been really quite supportive of these type of efforts, not only in my own lab, but in other labs across the U.S. And in addition, over the last five years, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has actually had a significant boost in funding to this, and hopefully we're now renewing this for another five years as well. So, I can end with the conclusions I started with. I won't read these again, but we need to be both humble and ambitious as we go forward. Humble in recognizing there are many unknowns that can really only be discovered by broad experimental synthetic efforts. Ambitious and striving to make these discoveries more frequently by taking advantage of any or all new experimental or computational or theoretical advances. So, try to incorporate in our colleagues who are trying to do band structure and see if they can help us in having sharp questions and hopefully insightful answers. So, with that all in, thank you for your tolerance. And I just have a question.
compare their curving temperatures, they actually are very analogous to high ZC material. Some people in the theoretical point. Oh, no, no, no. So, so we have heavy, we'll we'll heavy fermions. Let, let me ask my question. Sure. Uh, is there any overlap between the work that you're doing on purely inorganics and people who are working on organics? Is there any cross fertilization? Is there micro connections? Um, we started with superconductivity, okay? Uh, I, I don't know if you're going to see organics getting to as high as temperature, at least in the electron phone I'm eating, because I'm worried about doing it. Is there cross fertilization? Like, not, of course there is. Frankly, in terms of the physics of it, there's very little difference between um, uh, uh, inorganic and organic. If you look at MGD2, it's benzene. Um, uh, your, your, your two gaps are coming from a polling like sigma and pi. So, well, I think there's a lot of cross fertilization. One of the things I'm seeing right now is some uh, nominally uh, inorganic compounds, calcium ion, pure arsenic, two, and these four more four I mean, roughly, with the collapsed tetragonal phases, we're seeing super elasticity in them where you can compress them along the C axis by 20% reversibly. They're more elastic than some robbers. Um, so, no, I, I think there's a lot of cross fertilization. Um, I, I, I do not know if organics are going to get us as high as we're seeing some of these uh, hybrids or borides, but you know, in terms of Hamiltonians or physics, I think it's, it's virtually identical. That's part, precisely my point. I don't care about the ITC, I don't care about the mechanism, which we don't understand. And there may be similar mechanisms. Oh, yeah. You see, you go from spin piles to spin density, to oh, yeah. and you're to supernova. Yeah. In one material, That's as right. you change the chemical, yep. as you change the pressure. Absolutely. And, and again, I think MGD2 was very good in that sense because you know, the physics of it was really density. So again, you, you go from something that used to be inorganic, and the explanation of the banding and bonding is appalling. <coughs> You mentioned it's non collinear anti parallel that calcium, sure. uh, calcium ion 4 and arsenic 4. Yeah. Is yeah. it also a silver conductor? Oh, God, yes. Oh, no, no. Okay. Let's be careful. Um, so, here's our phase diagram, okay? Yeah. The pure material is away from this magnetic phase curve. Okay? On the other hand, as we substitute in nickel or cobalt, we still have superconductivity, and we have our uh, uh, spin vortex crystal. So this is like uh, uh, underdoped uh, uh, bearing one to two cobalt and potassium. In those cases, it's slight. In this case, we have this two two cobalt structure. And indeed, when we do uh, uh, both neutron scattering as well as MOS power, what we can see is that our magnetism, as we bring these close together. Our order parameter takes a hit and decreases as we drop into the superconductive state. It's not going to be observed in the uh, cobalt nickel system very much. You got it? So I get on the 1144. So um, is, it, is this magnetic structure different from what's claimed in the cesium and European 1144? Where they claim there's a curve magnet and a superconductor. Oh, just be very careful. In those cases, you have europium. Yes. It's divalent, but europium divalent has a uh, 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 seven halves, uh, J equals uh, uh, S equals seven halves. Okay? It's gadolinium. Okay? Um, uh, that's what's going ferromagnetic. This doesn't happen. So, no. This is the bare transition metal magnetism. You don't have any rare earth having a separate magnetic transition. So no, that's quite different. And uh, is there any study of these under pressure? Oh, not yet. Um, here. I, 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 I move these to uh, 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 backups, but uh, let's see, under pressure. Listen, yeah, pressure here. So these materials are really neat. So I've got calcium and potassium, okay? So with calcium ones, you do I apply pressure, Basically, you have the formation of arsenic arsenic bonding across the calcium layer. There's only the calcium that happens at low pressure. Here I've got calcium and potassium. And you squeeze on it, the calcium goes first, and we get a half collapse step. And then we squeeze more, and we get the potassium. Now, in collaboration with Joseph Valente and uh, Vladislav Borisov in Frankfurt, as part of his attempt to communicate them and interact with my computational colleagues. We've been looking at all the potential 
1144 and with calculator, that calculator, not sort of washed in, in, in pressure, all the half collapse can transition for all the various permutations of this. Okay. Now, in addition, this gives us a larger super elasticity because we have more to go across the gases. So it's in the 1144 that we have 17% super elastic behavior on these gases. Good stuff. Okay. Yes. So you can imagine the sense of more than one collapse, half collapse. There's a similarity with the European ones as well. I think. Well, you know, the yeah. Europeans looked at that as well. So yeah. We have published uh, uh, data, or at least we posted data, on half collapse that cross those as well. Yeah. So European, in terms of structurally, it's just an alkali earth. But when you ask magnetically, it's an alkali earth that has Catalonian moment. Yeah, we tried to do a calculation, but Rosa was faster. <laughs> and she was faster because I was lighting a fire under her tail saying, but you see, we've been doing collapse tough on this since the early days of, of, of calcium number two, so all the mechanisms were in place. Um, okay. um, so on the, again, on the 1144s, since you've got uh, inequivalent iron arsenide layers in there, when you substitute the cobalt and nickel and get the magnetic order. Is the magnetic order the same in the equivalent magnetic layers? Is there any inner structure along the axis? John, I think you're wrong. In, in, in one sense. No, no, no. I, I say it with no malice. Uh, the iron layers are equivalent to the alkali earth or not. Because any iron layer has arsenic and calcium on one side, arsenic and rubidium or potassium on the other. Iron layers are equivalent to asymmetric, but they're equivalent. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking of double layers. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. So, no, because we have to think about, we have to wrap our heads around this point. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? No, nope. if not, uh, let's sign the poll. And we have a break now, we can come back at 10.30.